We're joined now, Brody Miller from The Athletic. Brody, did you think there for a second you were about to go on the Will Kane show like I did? All right, let's see if we – Brody, we got you, Brody? Yeah, yeah, I'm here now. Hey! I'll double up audio there. Hey, there we go. All good. Did you think you were going on the Will Kane show like I thought you were there for about – I did. Seconds. I'm like, yeah. wow, did Jacob Hester just, yeah, just, just prank guest host in the, Yeah, guest host in the Will Kane show. Uh, glad to have you on, Brody. It's been a little bit since we've caught up. And some news came out today. Bo Pelini's uh, term sheet confirms he is making $2.3 million a year for three years. And they've got some uh, things tied into it. If he leaves for this job, that job, and the other. What's the latest on Bo Pelini's contract that you heard? Yeah, I mean, I think the the thing that stands out is pretty much, you know, I mean, he he has security. He's making he's, he's going to be the second highest paid assistant in college football, which is kind of crazy for somebody who hasn't even coached in college football or even at this level in a, in about six years. And then, you know, he he basically can leave for most jobs if he if he leaves for a head coach job or an NFL job, which I don't think is out of the question with with another year or two of kind of build, rebuilding his stock. He he has to pay nothing of a buyout. The the team that hires him would have to pay nothing. Now, if he if he takes another you know assistant job, then he would have to pay half his salary. But and if he takes anything in the SEC at all, then they have to pay the entire buyout, which would be quite a bit of money. But but yeah, I mean the big thing here is I mean he's a guy who's been making you know what two hundred thousand maybe less you know at Youngstown State the last right. five years. So granted, he was still getting his Nebraska buyout money all that time, which is obviously part of why that was okay. But yeah, massive pay increase for both players. LSU lost an, another analyst. Kevin Cosgrove goes to Texas Tech to be a linebackers coach. That news came out earlier today, but they've also brought in some analysts, two offensive guys, and Bo actually brings his defensive coordinator from Youngstown State. Uh, kind of give us a little uh, profile on these guys coming in. Yeah, I mean, the thing I always say with these hires is that, first off, you know, people are like, well, why are people losing these analysts and whatnot? I would start with the fact that, I mean, that's kind of the nature of these jobs in the first place. I mean, you're not hiring somebody to really be here for the long haul, and you also want to bring in a good mix of guys, which is kind of what you're doing. So, you know, for example, you have your Kevin Cosgroves of the world, somebody who is a extreme veteran defensive coordinator, has been in D.C. at Wisconsin and some of the top levels of college football. You know, he's not here to be to be an analyst for a long time, so obviously he's going to leave for a position coach. But then you want to bring in a mix of guys. So, you know, for example, you bring in Russ Calloway, a senior offensive analyst, you know, he comes, he was an offensive coordinator at Stanford. He's another, you know, young guy who's kind of rising up, you know, and then he kind of reminds you of maybe what a, what a Brad Cragthorpe was two years ago or what a, or what a DJ Mangus was coming in this year who is still on the staff. You also brought in another young guy in, in Tyler Tettleton to bring another offensive analyst. He, you know, former Ohio quarterback, you know, he's, he's had experience all over the place. Uh, he was a GA at Oklahoma, for example. He was a scout with the Jets. He was quality control with the Browns. So those are two you know, young minds that I think uh, are are kind of what they're looking for. You know, we'll see what happens with that pass game coordinator hire, but, you know, Steve Enzeming is still the OC, but you want young minds in there that are going to keep kind of pushing things forward, kind of bringing some new ideas and whatnot, you know, because the job of an analyst can mean so many things, right? You have a, a George Munoz, who's an analyst, but I mean, was in, you know, a lot of people would tell you is basically like the third offensive coordinator sometimes in that room, but then you have some other guys, sure, who are probably more just film breakdown guys, but and then yes, Donald DeLizio, the uh, you know Bo Pelini's assistant. That's another um, another guy who's going to bring a little continuity for Pelini on defense. So, and I'm sure there'll be many more hires to come. On passing game coordinator, it does seem like they are taking their time. They're bringing in it seems like you know, a slew of NFL guys. Almost like that's the route that they want to go. Do you think, in fact, Brody, that it will end up being someone who has NFL ties that comes in for that position? It definitely seems like it's just on the array of people they're looking at so far. We know Shane Waldron interviewed last weekend. He's a passing game coordinator for the Rams, who you know is kind of a rising star in coaching, and you know would seem like an actual massive home run hire. I mean, people might want to draw Joe Brady comparisons, but Joe Brady was a nobody. You know, Shane Waldron would be coming over to actually be a, you know, that would be a big coup for them. Now, I, 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 I would honestly be a little. I almost wonder if he's somebody who would look for a better job than that, which is why that caught me off guard. So that would be a big win. But yeah, a lot of the other rumors and whatnot have been NFL people. That's been the consistent word, and I think that kind of goes with that idea of yes, you've built this offense. You know, you you know you finally done it. You've achieved it, but you want to keep pushing forward. So I think the the mistake would be getting too stubborn and saying. You know, we want to be NFL every time. We want to keep going NFL, guys. You don't want to go by any template, right? You just want yeah. to find the guy who's the sharpest guy and keep moving. If that's a Shane Waldron, if that's somebody else, 
we'll see, but it's going to be interesting because as you know, the coaching carousel in college is, is kind of all wrapped up. Catching up with Brody Miller from The Athletic here on Hanging with Hester. So you don't really have to rush it because now that recruiting is over, you have spring football coming up, and obviously you want to have somebody in place before that happens, but it actually could be you know, a week, two weeks, maybe even three weeks before they actually name a passing game coordinator. Have you heard any kind of timeline as far as when they want to do it? Yeah, the timeline I heard, and I believe that Ogeron said it this week too, was that I, I think basically it's just you want to have it by before spring football starts, like you said. I think that's pretty much it. You know, it's kind of a funny thing because when this first happens, it's, it's kind of frustrating probably for LSU that it happens. this all happens so late and that you are behind on the timeline. But then once you get over that first part and that it is you are behind, then you can look at it as a blessing because you, you really are competing with nobody else for these guys. It's, it's pretty much you can take your time, do your interviews, do your due diligence, and actually just try to find the best guy without trying to rush to beat some other team or rush into some decision. I think, you know, if, if LSU handles it right, that could actually be a, a benefit for them. All right, we heard, uh, obviously, when Coach O talked earlier this week as well, LSU moving to a 4-3 defense under Bo Pelini. They've been a 3-4 under Dave Aranda. When you start to look at this roster, Brody, how do you think that will affect the defensive line when you see the guys that are already in place? We talked about it a little bit in our number one. Is it the D-line that's going to make the biggest transition? Is it the linebacking room because you have some outside linebackers? Maybe they play inside a little bit more. Where do you think we'll see the biggest change? Yeah, that's something I was actually looking forward to picking your brain about, too, is that, I mean, obviously, I think you and I might – defensive line on LSU is looking like it's going to be one of the two, three strongest groups yep. on this team in 2020. There's a lot of talent there. But you just wonder, you know, how, how do you place these guys around? Sure, you know, you know, basically you can have at least one of those D tackles will probably be a one-technique nose type anyway, so a Tyler Shelvin's going to be fine having a role. But, but what do you do with that second defensive tackle, you know, three-technique kind of spot? I mean, do you, do you put a Glenn Logan or a Neil Farrell there? Is one of those guys like a strong side defensive lineman? Is, or can you, can you find a role for Apu Aika, who obviously we all think is going to be has a chance to be another breakout candidate next year? These are, I mean, these, I don't think any of these are problems. I'm just really curious to see what Bo Pelini does to move those things around. Because sure, I think a lot of these edge rushers are going to become defensive ends, and you assume, you assume at least one of those D-line spots is going to be basically what the current outside linebacker is. But how does he piece those other three is really what has my attention. You know, with Justin Thomas, for example, what you know if he's back on the team this year, what kind of role does he have? Because he was probably their best pass rusher next last season before he got kicked off the team. So I'm really interested to see what happens there linebacker is tricky because you're replacing so much that it's yeah. not like there's continuity you're messing with. Right. I mean, we, we feel pretty confident the Clark's going to be one of those three linebackers, but after that, you know, it, it's all pretty fluid. It could be a Micah Baskerville. It could be a grad transfer. It very well might be a grad transfer. I, I think that's probably the area where you're going to see the most change technically, but I also just wonder how much moving around of athletes do you see there, you know? And, and one thing I was curious of, I want to hear your play, opinion as a player is, you know, Jacoby Stevens, a lot of people are suggesting would be a great 4-3 linebacker, and I don't disagree with that, but do you think he would be okay? Do you think he came back for a senior year to not play safety? That just seems hard to believe to me. It's a great question. It was actually where my next point was going to go, Jacoby Stevens kind of being that X factor because he would make a really good 4-3 inside linebacker, and I've kind of compared his career over the last year and a half to a Thomas Davis. Thomas Davis was an all-SEC safety at Georgia. Then he went on and he's played – 15 plus years in the NFL in a 4-3 playing inside linebacker. I think Jacoby can play inside linebacker at the next level. Has he heard that from other teams? Because, you know, when he put his name out there to see where he would fall in the draft. Because if he has, he can say, you know what? I want to get a year jump start on playing inside linebacker. I don't know if that's the case, but that's something that could happen because I do think Jacoby could be a standout 4-3 inside linebacker. But if you do that, Brody, then you've got to replace him in the defensive backfield. We know Todd Harris is coming back. Is there any other name? Could we see a Maurice Hampton maybe switch to that role, play more of a strong safety than a free safety? Yeah, I think if you're just going by a pure numbers game, you feel a little more confident moving Stevens away from safety than you would having you know, to fill those other two linebacker spots. Because at safety, yeah, you have you feel pretty confident Todd Harris is one of those guys. But yeah, you have Mo Hampton. I mean, I know you, you never want to count on a true freshman, but they think really, really highly of Jordan Tolles. Then there's that weird question of what ends up happening with Marcel Brooks because he can't be a 4-3 DN. We all know that, but and he, you know, he told me in December that, you know, he he's going to be a safety who kind of comes down to the line on third down like Jacoby Stevens. Well, 
we'll see if that happens. We'll see if his coverage can, you know, improve by them. But he's another X factor. I think you have a lot of just different. And there's still Eric Monroe still on this roster. Guys like that. I think you have more options at safety that you can sleep at night with than you probably do at linebacker right now. But like you said, it's almost like Zach Hess with baseball last year, right? Where it's, you know, he didn't come back to be a reliever, so they were going to keep him in the starting rotation no matter what. I just really wonder, because Jacoby Stevens, you and I also know, is one of the smartest, most well-thought-out, you know, really introspective people on the team. He might have the self-awareness to say, hey, I I should be a linebacker, and that's what I'll be suited best at, and I'll adjust. But it's also just kind of, it's tricky to believe he'd come back to not play the position he wants to play. It's a good point you make there, Brody. Uh, Cam Lewis, Eric Monroe, both back for their 72nd uh, season in an LSU uniform. Yeah, yeah. I think, <laughs> <laughs> wait, did you say seven? 72nd, yeah. They've been at LSU, yeah, it seems yeah, like, yeah. since uh, Jesus was a boy. But that's good. You've got veteran players, and they are still <laughs> yeah. on the roster, and that's sometimes names you forget about when you have a Grant Delpin and Jacoby Stevens in the starting role. Yeah, because Eric Monroe is a guy who was the number 55 recruit in the country coming out of high school. I mean, I remember talking to Bill Bush about a year ago, and he was like, Eric Monroe can do, like, physically is stud and can do so many things. It's just, can he ever be healthy? You know, I think that's been the number one question with him for literally four years now. I mean, yeah, if he ever just could prove he could be healthy and be there day to day, I, I would believe he actually could be a competitor there. But I just don't know if LSU counts on him. All right, he is Brody Miller. Does a great job covering LSU for The Athletic. Brody, we appreciate your time today. Oh, thanks for having me, man. Thanks for having me on the Will Kane show. Yeah, there you go. Absolutely. That's you gotta thank Lloyd for that one. All right. There he is, Brody Miller.